Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this second Sunday of Epiphany is from 1 Samuel chapter 3. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight was fading so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went, and he lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that our bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel is according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Christ. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, peace, and mercy unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this morning's message I've entitled, He Never Left. It's based on the question of Nathaniel who said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we worship an incredible Savior in Jesus Christ. Truly God, to be certain full of divine power, the power to raise us from the dead, the power to trample Satan under our feet. Yet at the same time, he is fully and truly human. He is ordinary. He is of Nazareth. He's Jesus of Nazareth, approachable for us. We pray, Lord, that we may see this mystery of the person of Jesus Christ while seeing him as powerful, also seeing him as approachable, for he is the Nazarene. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We Canadians, we can't help but follow American politics, and it's prudent that we do so. Prime Minister Trudeau, that is, Prime Minister Trudeau the Elder once said to a group of Americans, he said, living next to you is, in some ways, like sleeping with an elephant. You know, no matter how friendly and even-tempered the beast, if you want to call it that, we can't help but be affected by every twitch, grunt, and groan. So we watch Joe Biden going back to his childhood home. He's wearing an overcoat and a wristwatch that's far beyond the means of most of his constituents, and yet, interestingly enough, he's not wearing a necktie. He goes and visits his childhood home where he lived with his working class parents in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He went up onto the third floor, he came back down to the reporters, and he said, I wrote on the wall, from this house to the White House, live God's grace. It's a great political move for a politician to emphasize humble beginnings we, because we want to know that our leaders can relate to us, that they can relate to ordinary problems and ordinary life. And it's also motivational for so many because it tells the great American dream that where you start, is not necessarily where you need to end up. But the problem with all leaders is that when they leave this house and go to the White House, or whenever they leave their childhood home, if it is of humble means, and then go into the halls of power, they find it inevitable that they lose touch. A person grows and a person changes. It's an impossible challenge to accurately remember, no less than relive the experience of where you came from. But Jesus does the impossible. He never left his house, his poverty, or his people. In a way, he still hasn't left it. He remains Jesus of Nazareth right up until the end of his life and beyond. You know that Pontius Pilate wrote a title over top of his head on the cross. He, he got the soldiers to pound it in on a placard. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. For Jesus of Nazareth, the simplicity and poverty of Nazareth was not just where he started on a path to bigger, better things. Nazareth was where he remained throughout his earthly ministry. Jesus would say, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He took the marks of his passion into heaven, his nail-scarred hands, his feet, his ribbon side, and when he returns at the second coming, we're told, in the book of Revelation, Jesus will hold forth his hands 
And every eye shall see him, even those who had him pierced. He bears that suffering. And he bears that knowledge of humanity. He bears that sense of humanity in the weakest, poorest condition. And he returns from heaven with it. The omniscient Son of God retains his identity as the Nazarene, a citizen of a small, insignificant little village of no consequence. He takes that identity into heaven and comes back again. A good leader coming from a difficult child in ordinariness might well remember it enough to retain some compassion upon those who were who are where he once was. And we, we hope that's true of our leaders. But Jesus does the impossible. He retains his identity as the Nazarene and he takes that identity into eternity. He retains his humanity so that you can be certain that as you pray, as you bring your troubles to him, your ordinary troubles, troubles that you might think is beneath the God and the maker of heaven and earth and the planets and the stars and the vastness of the universe. You think all these little things are beneath him, but when we come to Jesus, we know that he understands. He retains that ordinariness about him. He never forgets how to understand, how to sympathize, how to empathize. Now, words are important. What is empathy? Empathy is something that goes beyond sympathy. Empathy means experiencing uh, someone else's feelings. Empathy requires an emotional component of really being in the heart and soul of another human being and reliving it with them. That emotional connection, that emotional component of really feeling what the other person is feeling. Sympathy, on the other hand, it's good to have sympathy, but it's not at the same level as empathy. Sympathy is more distant. It's more cerebral. You know? Sympathy uh, is something that is distant, more cognitive in nature, keeps a certain distance. But Jesus Christ, he possesses both, both sympathy and empathy. Because you see, Jesus never really left home. He was and he ever remains the Nazarene. We naturally forget the struggles of our past as we grow in years. We really become different people, especially as we prosper. We tend to you know, reinterpret some of the difficulties of our past. But Jesus, as the omniscient Son of God, relives everything he ever experienced beyond that of those even gifted with a photographic memory. You know, a person with a photographic memory has a real burden, I think. They can have the clearest images of what they were doing when they were six years old. But Jesus goes beyond mere photographic memory. He's got a photographic emotional memory. He relives the emotion. What a tremendous burden that must be. But Jesus carries such omniscient knowledge, total, complete knowledge of himself and others. He knows the Nathaniel in our text. Nathaniel sometimes known as Bartholomew, soon to be apostle of the Lord. And he knows every Nathaniel that bears that name and even those of us that don't bear that. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathaniel replied, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Jesus only needed to reveal a tiny detail about Nathanael to convince him, I saw you under the fig tree. But Nathanael, however, was not just convinced by that, nor was he convinced by his own intellect or inner reason. Like any other human being, he was convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit that was working through the Word. We read earlier in this passage that Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have, the found, we have found the one that Moses spoke about, that the prophets spoke about, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. We may have that same inner conviction of truth. What a wonderful thing it is to have that kind of certainty in our faith. We can have that same certainty of faith that was possessed by Nathaniel, knowing Jesus, knowing the one who saves, the one who is the Son of God, the one who is the King of Israel, for we possess the same scriptures, and even more scriptures than what Nathaniel had. We are promised the same working of the same Holy Spirit that Nathaniel experienced. Well, what sort of scriptures? Well, the law and the prophets. And you might ask, well, do any of the Old Testament scriptures speak about the Messiah to come as coming from Nazareth? Well, St. Matthew certainly thinks so. St. Matthew says, concerning Jesus. Then he went and settled in Nazareth, a town called Nazareth, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. I'm sure that this verse, as it was read to an Israelite, to whom Hebrew was a primary language, there would be that aha kind of moment as Isaiah 11, specifically the word translated branch in, in English, were contemplated. The branch was a common term for the Messiah, and it's in Isaiah 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The word that we have for branch, that we have for Nazareth, in Hebrew, it possesses the same letters. What is much more clear, though, in prophecy is that is about our Lord's commonness and his poverty. What is much more clear in prophecy is our Lord's poverty and commonness, which the village of Nazareth brings to mind. The very name of Jesus brings to mind our Lord's ordinariness. Now, the name Jesus has powerful meaning. It means the one who saves. But it is also an ordinary name. If, if the folks back then had books that had things like top ten names for girls and the top ten names for boys, you can be certain that in that top ten names for boys, you'd find the name of Jesus. It was a common name. But more than that, Jesus lived as a common man, as an ordinary man. There was nothing about him that said, be afraid, or this guy is of a high social standing, or any sense that you would be inhibited in coming towards him and asking him a question or asking for his help. Isaiah wrote this about him. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. Jesus never lost his ordinary status in the eyes of the people, even as he taught great things. He never lost that. Although his teaching was spellbinding and everybody acknowledged it, even his enemies acknowledged it, 
people would say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the son of Mary and his brethren are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Jesus grew up as a Nazarene, an ordinary boy that became an ordinary man, possessing an ordinary humanity and yet without sin. And he never left behind that identity, that material poverty, the characteristics of simplicity and vulnerability and sensitivity. He never left that behind ever. He carries the extremes of humanity's weakness while at the same time he has all the power of the divine. What a great mystery. And yet, this is the God whom we serve. Every sermon needs to have law and gospel. The law for today, the law that points out our sin, is this. Our sin is that we so often lose sight of who our Savior is. And we push Him away and we only allow Him to dwell beyond in the clouds somewhere. But I assure you that Jesus does not want to remain distant to you or to me. He wants to come close. The Holy Spirit comes close and gives us a repentant heart. And when that happens, let Him draw near. Don't push Him away. For He desires to forgive. He desires to strengthen us. He even desires to be a friend to us. He's closer than a brother. He is the simple Nazarene. And he's never truly left home, even as he's gone to his heavenly home. May this truth resonate in our hearts and give us confidence this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and keep you always. Amen. Let us confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance of the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who lift the Father and the Son together as worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of your dear Son and for the revelation of your will and grace. Implant your word in us that lift good and honest hearts. 
we may keep it and bring forth the fruits of faith. We humbly implore you to rule and govern your church throughout the world. Bless all those who proclaim your truth, that we may be preserved in pure doctrine of your saving word, and that faith in you may be strengthened, love toward others increased, and your kingdom extended. Send forth laborers into your harvest and sustain those whom you have sent, that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people and the gospel preached in all the world. Grant health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially Her Majesty the Queen, the Governor General, the Prime Minister and the Parliament, the government of this province, and all who have authority over us. Grant them grace to reign and rule according to your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. According to your good pleasure, turn the hearts of our enemies and adversaries that they may cease their hostilities and walk with us in meekness and in peace. Comfort, O God, live your Holy Spirit, all who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity. Grant courage and steadfastness, especially to those who suffer for your name's sake, that they may receive and accept their afflictions in the confidence that you will acknowledge them as your own. Although we have deserved your righteous wrath and punishment, yet we ask you, O most merciful Father, not to remember the sins of our youth, nor our many transgressions. Out of your unspeakable goodness and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger to body and soul. Preserve us from false doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart and despair of your mercy, and from an evil death. In every time of trouble, show yourself a very present help, the Savior of all, especially to those who believe. Cause all needed fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season, Give success to the Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations on land, sea, and air, and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, crowning them with your blessing. Receive, O God, our bodies and souls and all our talents. Together lift the offerings we bring you. For by his blood your Son has purchased us to be your own, that we may live under him in his kingdom. These and whatsoever other things you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life that, as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.